pull up some of the stories. I would like to read them. Hey, Adriana. Thank you, thank you. I hope you brought enough hot Cheetos to share. No, I'm kidding. I don't even like hot Cheetos. Like they taste good, but my stomach hates them. So more hot Cheetos for the rest of y'all. I'm, I'm the weirdo that likes pretzels, like big chewy pretzels. I have a big chewy Trader Joe's pretzel waiting for me at home. I'm very excited. Okay. So let me go ahead and look through some of these stories and I will not reveal who wrote what just out of respect so that way we can have a laugh without laughing at somebody. We are laughing with each other. Um, so on Wednesday, I told you a spooky ghost story about the, the, blah, 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 the war of the ghosts. Um, and so um, that story was a little weird, had a little gap few gaps in the narrative and there are some cult it's clearly a native american tale and because of that it's going to have different plot elements and literary conventions and storytelling conventions that are going to be really really different from how you or i do this and so um, i'm going to go through and just read a couple of your responses and i will grade them later uh, I've got a bunch of meetings today, so I, if I don't grade them today, I will grade them on Saturday. But let me kind of take a look and see what people are saying. Wait, we were supposed to just summarize no. whatever the story was, right? So yeah, I've got a few people that haven't turned in their stories, so make sure that you do so. If you could get it to me, at, uh, hopefully by tonight, but if, at the very latest, if you could get those to me tomorrow, that would be awesome. All right, so I'm going to download one story. Okay, I want to see. All right, so here's the first one I grabbed. Okay, so I'm going to read this. I hope that's okay. All right, where is it? Here. Why won't you let me read it? <laughs> oh, because apparently it's a zip file and it won't let me. What is this? Let me read it. Okay. Two friends who live on an island go to the shore one night with their boat. When they get there, they see a canoe paddled up to the shore with five men inside. They say that one of the men should come fight with them in the war. One of the men says he refuses to go because he doesn't want to die. He has a family that he has to think about. He says his friend would be happy to go with him. The friend agreed and got in the canoe with the five men and set off to another island where the war was happening. When he got there, the battle was in full swing. Arrows were being shot left and right and many people were dying. The man got shot, but he didn't die. He marveled at how this could be possible. After the battle and all the death, the man went back to the home island. He told everyone about the amazing thing that happened. He told them about the battle and how he was shot but did not die. He told the entire island until the sun came up the next morning. When the sun came up, he fell over with blood spilling out of where he got shot. He was dead. So this story got the last line perfect. He was dead. How many of you ended the story with he was dead? because that's how the story actually ends. Now, there are a couple of things in this retelling that I actually think are interesting. First of all, ghosts are never actually mentioned at all in the story. The man had that weird realization um, after they said, that Indian has been hit and the man goes, oh, they are ghosts. And what's interesting is I never actually see that in this story. The other thing that I find interesting so in the story, something dark came out of the man's mouth. This person changed it to blood and also from the area where he had been wounded. So you can kind of see how something black coming out of his mouth. How many of you put that it was blood? How many of you put that it was uh, something like vomit or something like a bug or something like that? Anybody? Yeah, a bug coming out of his mouth would be kind of weird. That would make it even spookier. Um, so I think that that was pretty good with most of the details. Um, let me take a look at another one. Let me see what I got. Let me see. Oh, there it is. That 
is not what I wanted. Okay, let me download that again. Okay, let me try that again. Okay. Here we go. Okay. The story begins with two men. Something happens, so they hide. One man leaves. There was a fight. There are ghosts. He could see ghosts, and then he died. So that's pretty brief. But it hits most of the major plot points. Um, obviously, it misses some of the finer details, but the main points are there. Um, so what I think is notable about this one is that that's a really long drawn out story. Like the first story that we read was massive on the details, like lots of details. I actually found the detail level for that first story pretty good in light of all of the details that were given. Uh, in the actual story. This story hits all of the major plot points um, and is able to remember the major plot points, but there are less details. And one of the things that we do find is that some of the details are harder to parse. So there's that weird part where the man just suddenly realizes that there are ghosts. Um, they don't know who the war is. Are they warring with another tribe? They just say, we're going to make war with the people. So. Um, this one hits the major points. And uh, I think that that's really good given that there's a lot of detail in this story. Okay, we're gonna read one more. Download, download. Okay, all right. Where is it? Where did it go? Zip. Okay, two men went to hunt some seals. Okay, so this is the first time I've heard of hunting seals and that actually did happen in the story. So awesome to whoever caught this one. Two men went to hunt some seals and heard war cries and then they hid until a canoe came along and the people in the canoe said they were going up to a river to make war and the men were like, we have no arrows. And the canoe people were like, they're in the boat. One didn't want to go and the other went. They went up river and killed a bunch of people and then they were ghosts, question mark, question mark, question mark. Yeah, that ghost revelation is a little weird. The man went home and made a fire and told the story of the war and then he died, lol. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of how I feel when I read this sometimes too. I'm like, where's this? Where's the plot points coming from here? So really good job retelling these stories. Um, really, I just wanted to see how your recall looks based on a very complicated story that you only heard once. So for those of you who didn't get that to me, if you could get that to me later tonight, if you weren't in class on Wednesday, you can find this on the filmed YouTube live stream. So watch the story if you weren't here on Wednesday, um, watch the story and then write down everything that you can remember from that story um, and get that to me if, if I would say ideally tonight, tomorrow at the very, very latest. All right, so, the last time we were here, we were talking about semantic memory. And now we're probably going to talk about my favorite type of memory. Um, now, I know that it's very tempting to think that working memory is my favorite type of memory because, well, I study it. Um, by the way, great job on your exams, everybody. I already graded them. Well done. Um, so, I actually really enjoy talking about this type of memory because ultimately it is what makes us who we are. We are going to talk about how memory works in everyday life. And in particular today, we are going to talk about what is called autobiographical memory. So this is memory that is all about your own personal life narrative, the events that are a part of your life story. So Fiona is visiting us today and I think you picked a great day to come. I really love talking about this section. And then next week, we'll talk about eyewitness testimony and stuff like that. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. So we're gonna start by talking about some of the differences in research methods that we do for standard memory research and how we tend to study uh, everyday memory. There's gonna be a bit of a difference. Then we'll talk about autobiographical memory. We'll talk about eyewitness testimony. 
And then we'll talk about prospective memory. So most of the time when we talk about memory, we're talking about a type of memory that we refer to as retrospective. That means we're looking backwards. When we talk about prospective memory, we are talking about memory for remember, it's basically remembering to do something in the future. So the next time that I see this person, I need to let them know that I have their wallet. I need to take my medication at seven o'clock every night. Um, and we'll talk about some of the differences between prospective memory and retrospective memory as well. So we're gonna start by talking about everyday memory research. And while you are writing things down, I will grab my Dr. G fuel. I'm happy to report, this is the only can I am having today. <laughs> and I only had one yesterday too, so go me. I discovered I can have tea that has caffeine in it to try to help me kick my soda habit. Oh, 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 that never happens. I never have my nose pop out. Okay, so we're gonna start by talking about how research on everyday memory is different from research on memory that we've talked about previously. So everyday memories are typically going to be older than the kind of memory studies that we do. So for example, I give you a list of words and then I ask you to remember them for later. So when I do that type of memory study, you may, those memories may only be about five minutes old. They might be at most maybe an hour old or maybe a couple of weeks old. But when we're talking about everyday memories from our everyday life and our personal autobiographical memories, these memories are gonna be older than the materials that we typically work with in a standard memory research study. Additionally, because a lot of these memories make up their own, make, or make up your own personal life narrative, you've rehearsed them a lot more. So for example, um, we are probably coming up uh, in 2021. For me, that will be, uh, especially when we get closer to graduation, I don't know what graduation is gonna look like next semester, but I know we're gonna have one. But as we get closer to May 2021, that will be the 10 year anniversary of me getting my PhD. So that's gonna be a time where I am rehearsing what it was like for me to graduate and get my PhD. Um, so we tend to rehearse those things more. Every time that there's an anniversary, a family get together, a special event that happens in your life, you're gonna rehearse it. And you're probably rehearsing those memories a lot more than, what did I have for breakfast yesterday? I don't do that. And I don't think you do either. <laughs> so basically Cohen refers to this as memories of memories. So remember how I kind of talked about anytime that you're looking at a memory, are you viewing it from a first person perspective or a third person perspective? And a lot of you said that your memories are viewed as if you are watching yourself in a movie or on stage. That shows that that memory has been distorted because generally, unless you have a mirror or you're like me and you're actually looking at a video of yourself on the screen, which I gotta tell you is really weird. Aside from that, you don't have a third person perspective of your memories. You only have a first person perspective. So it's clear that it's a memory of a memory. Additionally, for a lot of these everyday memories, the learning is unintentional. So think about it. When, you're, when you graduated high school, how many of you was that a memorable event for? Yeah. And for many of you, graduating college will be a memorable event. I'm the first in my family to graduate college. That was a huge deal. But, oops, sorry. As I was sitting there 
with thousands of other people, I wasn't sitting there going, okay, I need to try to rehearse this. I'm gonna need to remember this for later. Nobody does that. It's like when you have these big events happen in your life, you don't rehearse them the way that you rehearse materials when you're studying for a test. So the learning is often what we call incidental. You weren't deliberately trying to remember it for later. Now compare that to memory studies where I explicitly tell you, you need to try to remember this for later. So you can see that there's a huge difference in our everyday memories versus the type of memories that we often tend to research. I feel like I'm about to cover up my eyes just to make sure it doesn't pull up my nose again. Additionally, there are some social factors that we have to take into account. So oftentimes when we are learning memories for a later test in a research study, there's not a strong social component there. The social component is everything in everyday memories. You are influenced by the people that you are around. You are influenced by your culture. And these factors will play into how you interpret those everyday memories. And additionally, when we are doing memory studies, so when I say, here's a list of words, I need you to remember these for later. We often want the goal to be accuracy. With everyday memory, the goal is typically not accuracy. Oftentimes, going back to these social factors, one of the biggest goals of our everyday memory is entertainment. We tell stories of our lives and our memories to friends. When we get together with family, we share memories. Every time I get together with my family, it turns into a, let's all get together and talk about the funny things that Dr. Gilchrist used to say when she was seven years old and very precocious. So people start sharing memories. These are, more designed for entertainment, for connection, for sharing. The goal is not accuracy. So here's a question, and yes, that is animated. Um, is there a story that one of you, that you or one of your family members that has become so embellished and told more for entertainment value to the point where it seems like that memory may not be accurate? Does anybody have an example? Hmm? Well, I'll tell you one if you don't if, if you don't care to share. Do you at least know that there are some stories that exist? You don't have to share though. So Normally, I would tell you an embarrassing personal story about me growing up, but I've decided to change my mind and do one about my sister instead. So one of our favorite things to do when I was growing up, and this is a story that we retell all the time. Um, one of the things that we used to like to do as part of our vacation, um, we didn't always have a lot of money. And we lived about half an hour away from Disney World. So a pretty common thing that we would do is we would go to the Disney World area, rent a hotel, not on the Disney property, hang out there for a day or two, and go to some restaurants uh, and go check out Disney World different parts uh, at different parts of the day. We were also those people that would not get food at the park. And when it was time for lunch, we would leave the park and go to our hotel and eat sandwiches. I hated that. Um, but one night was really special. We got to go to the Olive Garden. And I know the Olive Garden is like basic level stuff, but I grew up in like chain restaurant, like suburbia. So I'm like, ooh, it's Olive Garden breadsticks. And this was like the mid nineties when everybody was wearing like those big clunky high heeled sneakers and nobody loved them more than my little sister who was probably in middle school at this point. 
So we get to the Olive Garden, me, my cousins, and my aunt and my mom and my sister. And it turns out that there's going to be a little bit of a wait. So my sister decides it would be a lot of fun. So there are these like wooden beams that I guess are holding up a canopy or something. And she just, just decides to spin around them. And then her heeled sneaker catches something and she falls and just scrapes her knees. And she's quiet, except for one word that leaves her mouth. She goes, dude. And then we start laughing our heads off because just the quiet and the dude. And she starts bawling. She's like, you're laughing at me. And so that's how I remember it. I have a feeling that I might be embellishing because my sister and I did not get along when we were teenagers. And so if there was an opportunity to watch her suffer, oh, you better believe I'd, I'd play that up to the hill. So I have a feeling that if I went and I talked about this with my sister, she would tell me a very different version of events. But when my family gets together we and she's around, we go, dude, and it really bugs her. And don't worry, if she were here, she would tell you a bunch about me. She could tell you about the time I tried to hide from my mom in the pantry. And I said I could probably live there forever because there was a bunch of canned food. And my mom goes, we don't have a can opener in there. <laughs> so I had to come out. So odds are pretty good. You've got a story that you've told your family uh, so much that it's basically become for entertain it's become for entertainment purposes rather than accuracy purposes and this matters here's why i bring it up so the goal of everyday memory is not accuracy the goal of everyday memory is to entertain to build connection to share with others and generally what we remember is often going, be, going to be determined by the goals that we actually have. So um, sometimes our memories are actually gonna be deliberately distorted. And this is what Marsh and Tversky reported in um, 2004. Um, so basically students ended up having to keep records of uh, retelling their personal memories for basically a month. Marsh and Tversky found that about 42% of those memories were inaccurate and distorted. Um, and due to Kovic and colleagues in 2004, did a very similar sort of thing. They asked people to read a story and they had to either recall it with a goal for accuracy or a goal for entertainment. So accuracy fits how we typically do memory research. Entertaining is typically how we approach memory in the real world. And generally, Dudakovic and colleagues found that when your goal of sharing a memory is to entertain, you're going to add details, you're going to exaggerate, you're going to add embellishments, and all of those things lead to a greater opportunity of distorting that memory. So interestingly enough, um, Hellman and colleagues basically watched a video of a pub brawl. And during this, um, they were told to describe the brawl to another person. And depending on the situation, they were basically told either person A started it or person B started it. So it was basically, did Han shoot first or did Greedo shoot first? It's one of those situations for those who enjoy Star Wars. So the people who believe that person A started it, that was going to affect what they told the, re, uh, what they told the other person. If you believed it was person B, that would affect how you told the story to another person. So the retelling of that pub brawl ended up being biased toward whether the listener believed that person A or person B was responsible. And later recall of this retelling actually reflected that as well. So basically the more biased stories 
uh, the more biased retellings led to worse free recall of events. So entertainment and accuracy are basically cross purposes when it comes to the goals and what ends up happening to memory as a result. So your book actually terms this the saying is believing effect. So basically what this means is that when you tailor your message about an event for a particular purpose, it later affects how you view the event in memory. So keep that in mind. Does anybody need some more time here? Okay. So now we're going to talk about my favorite type of memory to talk about. We're going to talk about autobiographical memory. So autobiographical memory is basically the, are, are basically made up of those memories that are really critical to our life story. Like these are the big events that are important in your life. So what is autobiographical memory? So these are memories that relate to our personal past and experiences. These are typically going to be uh, very complex events. They're often going to be important for our life story and they tend to extend back years to decades. So by the way, what type of form of memory would this be? Is this declarative or non-declarative? Would this be a declarative memory or a non-declarative memory? Declarative. Ow. <laughs> That's not the answer, by the way. Declarative. Anybody have an answer? Is it declarative or is it non-declarative? Oh, let's see, what do we got in the chat? No, I can't. Oh, you know why? I can't hear you because I don't have the speaker turned on. Oh, what are you saying? Yeah, thank you. Can you, can you, can you talk now? Hello? Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, I'm sorry, the button was turned off. I'm sorry. Yeah, okay. it's declarative okay. because you tell people about it and it's like facts and like. Yeah. So autobiographical memory is a form of declarative memory. I'm really sorry I wasn't ignoring you, I promise. <laughs> All right. So here's what's really important. Oh, wait, other people are still writing. I get too excited when I talk about this. Sorry, I'm not, I, 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 I have to answer an email. It's pretty urgent, so I'm sorry. Okay. All right, there we go. So let's compare and contrast episodic memories to autobiographical memories. So episodic memories are personal experiences at a time or a place. Now, when we compare them, to autobiographical memory. Let's be clear. Autobiographical memory, I would argue, is a subset of episodic memory. But here's what's really important. Most episodic memories are super trivial. Your personal life story probably does not hinge on what you had for breakfast yesterday or that time that you drove to the store. For most of us, these are going to be very trivial, ordinary events that are not important to our life narrative. And often we're gonna find that they extend back minutes to hours, as opposed to years to decades that we would see for autobiographical memory. So on a test, you might be, you might be asked to explain the difference between these two types of memory. Okay. 
I keep touching my mask. <laughs> All right. Oh, sorry. <laughs> okay. So when we talk about autobiographical memory, we are typically going to be discussing two major types of autobiographical memory. So we have a type that is referred to as a flashbulb memory. These are usually very clear and detailed events that are usually things that are so detailed largely because they have a very strong emotional component to them. Oftentimes researchers, when looking at flashbulb memories, will look at memories that are basically uh, ones that are kind of critical for our national consciousness or our global consciousness. Oh, let me see. Kind of, but kind of not. Kind of, but kind of not. Uh, flashbacks are often going to be, they could be flashbulb memories or they could just be remembering of autobiographical memories. But um, flashbacks are often unwanted and you're not necessarily deliberately trying to remember them, but you could potentially argue that if they are super detailed and if they are emotional, then it might be a flashback. Now, having said that, though, um, flashbacks often tend to have very negative emotional content. Not all flashbulb memories are negative in nature. A lot of the major ones that we are going to talk about are, but things like a high school graduation or a wedding or the birth of a child, all of these things can technically be flashbulb memories. It's just that they're a little bit harder to study because they only happen to one particular person. For research purposes, when we are looking at flashbulb memories, we're usually gonna be looking at like the big events where everybody's like, where were you when this happened? And people can usually tell you where they were in a very detailed way. So we're gonna talk about flashbulb memories and then we're going to talk about your own personal memories across the lifespan. So here's the deal. I'm, I, am, I am turning into an old and I am not necessarily getting any younger. So I will tell you that a lot of the flashbulb memory research that I am going to be referring to are things that happened well before many of you were born. Um, so for example, the last really big flashbulb memory that I remember is September 11th, 2001. And to put that into perspective, I was a college freshman. I was in my first two weeks of classes to put this into perspective. And that was a very scary thing. Um, now, one question that I would have for you. So most of you are younger than me and we haven't really had necessarily, we haven't had anything on the same level of September 11th. But if you had to think of another type of flashbulb memory where everybody remembers where they were, what do you think another one would be? So a few people were talking with me the other day and they recommended something like Sandy Hook, the Sandy Hook shooting. Does everybody remember where they were for that one? No. How about Michael Jackson's death? No. Most people, okay, most of you remember where you were when Michael Jackson died. Um, how, oh, let's see, Osama, when they caught Osama bin Laden in 2011, I think I was getting ice cream with my partner. We were like eating frozen custard and talking about it. That's what I remember. Um, but I think in all of those cases, it's a lot more variable because I certainly know where I was when I heard about Michael Jackson. I remember where I was when I heard about um, the Sandy Hook shooting. I was Christmas shopping in a mall in Atlanta. I also remember where I was when I heard about the passing of Whitney Houston. I was in a shopping mall in Atlanta. I liked to shop a lot when I lived in Atlanta. Um, but it's a lot harder to find a good flashbulb memory like that that has been embedded into our consciousness. 
Probably the best example that we might have is election night 2016. Maybe we'll see if we get another one, who knows? <laughs> okay. So flashbulb memories are vivid, detailed memories of significant and dramatic events. These are often going to be unexpected and they print permanent details into the memory system. So again, this is a case where you weren't necessarily trying to remember that. So something I keep coming back to, has anybody played Telltale's The Walking Dead game? Like the first one with Clementine and Lee? Oh, that game makes me cry. Um, but one of the things they find it, that I find about that game is that when you make the choices, it affects character relationships and they will say something like character will remember that. It's not like when these things happen that there's a little cursor that goes, you will remember that. It's not like you will remember that, but it's not because you're actively trying to. It's because these are very unique events. So most of the time, our, our, the events in our life are very everyday. They're very, very mundane. And then something happens that is out of the ordinary and shakes it all up. You go to class and then you go to a class and then a classmate comes up to you and tells you that the World Trade Center towers have collapsed because of plane, because of a plane. And your social psychology instructor comes in and starts crying and cancels class. And then your college cancels class for the rest of the afternoon. And then you go back to your residence hall, there's a big screen TV out front, and you are watching the footage of these towers collapsing over and over again. And it was very scary. And you don't mean to remember it, but you do. You aren't trying to remember it, but you will. And that's what it was like for me. So what sort of things are included in a flashbulb memory? And I will actually use my example of the September 11th attacks, because for me, that is an event that is absolutely in my national con in my consciousness. So here's what's really interesting to me. I vaguely remember where I was when I heard about Sandy Hook. I vaguely remember where I was when Michael Jackson passed. The local ice cream shop in Columbia changed all the flavors to Michael Jackson songs, which was kind of cool. Um, but I mean, he's a problematic person, but you can like the music. And I mean, we can get into death of the author and separating the art from the artist another time. Uh, <laughs> um, so, Oftentimes, there's going to be an informant who supplied that information. And what I've tended to find, the older that I've gotten, the informant is no longer a person the way that it used to be. It's the internet. It's a post on Facebook. And I'm like, oh, everybody's posting about David Bowie. I wonder why. Oh, no, David Bowie. Or everybody's posting about Prince. I wonder why. Oh no, I look up the news once again. So oftentimes lately, my informant has been the news. But in September 11th, this was 2001, I didn't have one of these. <laughs> um, and so it was a person. So I remember getting up that morning, going to my psych of women class. And I remember turning on the TV in my dorm and noticing that a plane had hit the first World Trade Center tower. So there's smoke coming from the building. Both of the buildings are still up because it's nine o'clock in the morning. And I remember, okay, so this is 18 year old Dr. Gilchrist who thinks she's better than everybody and smarter than everybody and knows everything and thought it was an accident, like a pilot error. Here's what I did when I was 18 and I saw this. I rolled my eyes and went, idiots. And then I went to class. Yeah, I'm gonna regret that. <laughs> And I still do. Um, so I go through class. This is an hour and 15 minute class. Nothing really changes. And then a student and her name escapes me. I don't remember who, what her name was, but I remember I sat next to her in every social site class and she goes, did you hear about the World Trade Center? 
And I said, yeah, a plane hit it. And she goes, that's not all. And then she proceeds to tell me everything. And it sounds like a joke. It sounds like she's making it up. So the place that I heard this, um, I distinctly remember being in Florida State University's lecture hall, the Longmire building. Uh, what was the ongoing event? Students were milling about. Some of them were coming into the lecture hall. Other people were leaving. I was just getting a better seat because my classes were back to back in the same lecture hall. Uh, the emotional state of myself, I was in disbelief. I saw that my professor, Dr. Plant, was crying. And the consequences of the event were classes were canceled. I went home and spent the better part of the day with my roommate constantly in tears. And here's the really weird part, y'all. There was not a lot of TV to watch that week. Like several TV channels basically went dark for a week. It was weird. So kind of filling that in, the informant was my classmate. I forget her name. I think her name was Jenny. I don't remember. Uh, where I was in between the psych of women and social psychology classes in the Longmire building. Ongoing event, everyone's talking, classes are canceled. My emotional state was skeptical. I'd only seen the aftermath of a plane hitting the first tower. And at that point, we didn't realize it was a coordinated attack. Um, it, I thought it was an accident, a pilot error, which is why I went, idiots. <laughs> uh, the emotional state of other people. Dr. Plant was in tears, my professor for social psych. And the consequences, um, I cried all day long watching the footage. And also, uh, I kind of learned not to be, for lack of a better term, an elitist little snot bag. <laughs> so this is kind of my example. And I'm sure if you've thought about this with respect to those big events in your life, you might have very similar sorts of setups. So here's where it's really important. These memories are vivid. Look at all those details I remembered. Now, do I remember what I was wearing? No. Do I remember what anybody else was wearing? No. So the critical question becomes, these are pretty vivid. They're almost like looking at a photograph. That's where they get their name, flashbulb memory, like you took it with a photograph. So are they accurate? Now, PESDEC in 2003, like if you were a memory researcher at one of the universities in New York or in that area, this was like a prime opportunity for you. And I'm not saying it's a good thing that 9-11 happened, but I think a lot of memory researchers were able to capitalize on this opportunity. Do you know what the previous big flashbulb memory was before this? The Challenger disaster in 1984. I was two, maybe three. <laughs> so, it had been a while since we'd had an event like this and certainly not one uh, like this on an emotional scale. So PESDEC and colleagues basically asked participants if they remember a plane hitting the, actually seeing the plane hit the first tower on September 11th. Now here's what's really critical. And somebody did point out to me that somebody does have it on videotape, but we didn't have that at the time. And the only way that you would have actually seen a plane hit that first tower is if you were in New York, right near the World Trade Center at that moment. For the rest of us in the United States, when we saw it, we saw the aftermath. We saw smoke coming from the first tower. We never actually saw a plane hit it. But 73% of people say yes. They remember where they were when they saw a plane hit the first tower. That's not possible. That is not possible. But what's happening here is that because we now know that the first tower was hit as part of that attack, knowing what we know now, we incorporate that information into our memory. There's no video footage of that. There's no video footage of a plane hitting the first tower. Like I said, we have some now, 
but obviously most people did not have that readily available to them in 2001 or even 2003. So people are distorting their memories based on new knowledge. And this also suggests that despite the claim that our flashbulb memories are really detailed, what we're learning is, is that they are not accurate. At least they're no more accurate than any other type of memory out there. So we distort the memory because we know, because of what we know about the event now. It's almost like that consistency bias that we talked about in McRaney. We change our memories of things to fit with how we understand ourselves now. We want to appear consistent. Well, I hope you have a wonderful Friday, despite the fact that this weather is yucky. It's perfect hot chocolate, hot coffee weather, or, or this is what I call soup weather. This is soup weather, soup with big piece of bread. All right, let me see if we have enough time to go over one more slide. And if we don't, I'll just call it here. Bless you. Okay, I think we have room for one more. Is everybody good? Okay. So it can be really difficult to assess accuracy. And generally, it would stand a reason that if these are permanently stored, which they are, and they're rehearsed constantly, they should have some amount of consistency. So what you're looking at here is um, Ruben and Tallarico from 2003 basically looked at the vividness ratings and the consistency of both flashbulb memories and everyday memories of, over a, a period of up to 224 days. So here's our vividness. Now, what you're gonna notice is that the everyday memories become less vivid over time. The flashbulb memories generally don't. There's, they stay very, very vivid. On the other hand, look at the difference in terms of consistency over time. Both flashbulb memories and everyday memories become less consistent and more distorted over time. So what this tells us, flashbulb memories are special because they're vivid, but they're not any more accurate or consistent than other types of memories. So we'll talk some more about this next time. And we'll talk about everyday memory. You do not have a quiz this week, but if you haven't recalled the War of the Ghosts, get it to me soon, please. I like giving you points. <laughs> All right, so everybody have a wonderful weekend. If you're going out of town or if you're going back home or visiting people, make good choices. Don't lick doorknobs. And I will see you all here on Monday.